What is up, guys? I am the Solid Monster, and this is your AEW Dynamite Homecoming Review. They were back home in Daly's Place in Jacksonville. It is Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. You know, AEW has this nostalgic feeling about Daly's Place every time they go back there. Obviously, Daly's Place was important to them because that was their home for the entirety of the pandemic. And Daly's Place is a very nice venue. I don't necessarily share the same kind of, uh, I don't know, sentimental feeling that they have for it. I mean, it's a nice venue and everything, but they they go nuts with all the, you know, it's great to be back here in Daly's Place. And it's it's like this uh, almost religious monument uh, to AEW here. But it was nice. You know, we had a hot crowd tonight and we had what basically was, in many ways, kind of another tribute show to Brody Lee is kind of what this show was. It was partly a tribute show to him because when Brody Lee debuted in AEW back in 2020, unfortunately, he debuted in front of no fans, which really sucked because he was going to make his debut in his hometown. He didn't have the chance to do that. And he only wrestled in front of either no fans or very limited people at Daly's Place before he passed away. He never had the chance to wrestle in front of an actual AEW crowd. And so tonight, they aired highlights of his brief career in the company. I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that I believe his son, Brody Lee Jr., negative one, uh, he had the chance to uh, make some matches on this show. In fact, the two eight-person tags that we had on tonight's show, I believe, were put together by negative one. So you'll have people who look at this and go, well, how come we had a couple of just random-ass tag team matches it was because Negative One played matchmaker for the night. He put at least those two matches together. I don't know if he put more together or not. But in the main event tonight, we had Sting and Darby Allin taking on Kanosuke Takeshita and Powerhouse Hobbs. This was a false count anywhere, tornado tag team match, anything goes. On the show last week, we saw Takeshita pick up a win over Darby Allin. The two of them had a hell of a match. But with Takeshita beating Darby, it seemed pretty clear where we were going in this match, that coupled with the fact that Sting is undefeated in his AEW career, you had to know coming into tonight that Sting was not going to lose this match. This was not going to be a loss for Sting and Darby, this close to his final match of Revolution. And it wasn't. Sting actually picked up the win for his team. He almost killed himself in the process doing it because they did a big spot at the end of the match where they were on basically a like almost basically a platform they were on <laughs> on like a ledge and then two tables set up down below the spot was a scorpion death drop through both tables they only went through one table they missed the first one they went through the second one sting won the match he was down for a while it was a little scary there for a bit the doctor checked up on him. Even Darby looked concerned. He was talking to Sting. You know, I, I mean, I could go on about these Sting spots that we've seen him do, these ridiculous risks that he takes when he came off the ladder and he basically busted his whole mouth up. You know what? We're close to the end. We're getting close to the end. There's no talking him out of doing spots like this. All we got to do is just get to Revolution. He'll have that final match. God only knows what he's going to do there. I'm, ar I'm already sweating bullets about what this guy's got in his head for what he's going to do in that match. But then it'll be over. Hopefully not for good. But when the match was over and Sting got his wits back about him and he got in the ring and Tony Schiavone asked him point blank, we're going to be in Greensboro for your final match. And they've sold over 15,000 tickets for that show. That is all on the back of Sting's retirement. They are not moving 15,000 tickets this far in advance in Greensboro for anything other than Sting's retirement match. So they're going to have a packed house in that venue that night. And he asked him, who do you have in mind for your final opponent? And before Sting could say anything, before he can answer the question, the Young Bucks, who we have not seen, I believe, since full gear. The Young Bucks made their way out. And they had a bit of a new look. They shaved. They were wearing the Vince McMahon uh, creepy mustache. One dressed in black, one dressed in white. Nobody said a word. All they did was stare at each other until they went off the air. And so the implication is that the Young Bucks are going to be Sting's final opponents. It's going to be Sting and Darby against the Young Bucks at Revolution. And I'm sure already there's going to be, you know, a ton of hate for that. 
you know, why the Young Bucks? Why are they slotting themselves in there? I'm not enthusiastic about that being the match, if that is going to be it. I know a lot of people would prefer it be Sting and Darby one-on-one, because that's a match that we haven't seen. It would make sense. It could be a passing of the torch moment. But here's the thing about that. Darby is on record as saying he does not want that match. He does not want to wrestle Sting one-on-one. Sting has also not had a singles match at all in the entire time that he has been in AEW. There's a reason for that. Either he doesn't feel confident that he could carry himself in a singles match, and or the company is trying to protect him because Sting himself, let's be honest, probably doesn't think he could carry himself in a singles match. He knows his limitations at this point. Darby is the one who can go out there and he could kill himself and he could do all the crazy shit and Sting can be there to kind of pick up the slack, do a big crazy spot. It's worked, right? It's been a, a, a good working relationship. The two of them complement each other in that way and it's worked so far. So we're not going to get Sting and Darby and not necessarily because Tony Khan doesn't want it, but because It's probably just not meant to be. So forget about Sting and Darby. Probably not going to happen. What I thought would be a great idea, and I still feel it would be a great idea, because Sting's retirement should be a big deal, and he has been very protected up until this point. I think the story, and that's really what it boils down to here, it's always a lot made of AEW. Where's the story? Where's the story? It's just matches without story. There's a story here where Sting is trying to win one last championship before he calls it quits. And maybe it's not even Sting who wants to do it. Maybe it's Darby Allen who wants to do it for Sting and says, you deserve one more title before you hang it up for good. And I want to be there by your side to help you do it. And it becomes Sting and Darby trying to get the tag team titles. This is their last chance. This entire run, it's kind of shocking, to be honest with you, that they haven't challenged for the belts already. But the story is there for Sting and Darby to go after the tag team titles, and in Sting's final match, the two of them finally do it. They win the titles, they get this big happy moment at the end of Revolution, and Sting gets to retire as a champion. And it would be a happy moment for everybody in Greensboro, it would be a happy moment for everybody who's a Sting fan. Now, Right now, Ricky Starks and Big Bill are the tag team champions. Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara are wrestling for the titles next weekend. Well, this upcoming weekend, this Saturday, Battle of the Belts, right? I think this is the ninth Battle of the Belts they're doing. How many title changes have we actually had at these Battle of the Belts specials? They've done eight of them so far. Maybe we've had one title change. It feels like a good time to do a title change, although I'm not sure if Jericho is the right person for that. But here's the thing. Here's what would make me care about seeing the Young Bucks against Sting and Darby. If those belts were to make their way around the Young Bucks' waist in some way between now and then, it it doesn't feel like there's enough time for that, especially because the champions right now are heels, and so are the Young Bucks. But if those belts were to find their way around the Young Bucks' waist, and you did the Young Bucks defending the tag team titles against Sting and Darby at Revolution, and we got to see Sting beat the fuck out of Matt and Nick Jackson, and take the tag team titles from them, that's a story that I could get behind. That would make me interested in seeing the Young Bucks in the ring with Sting and Darby. To just do the Young Bucks against Sting and Darby without anything really at stake, it doesn't do anything for me. And I'm sure the Bucks will be in there, and I'm sure they'll be great as far as bumping around for Sting. Not that they're bad opponents in the ring, they're going to be careless with him or anything like that. They're going to give him a melter driver in the middle of the ring. They might do that to Darby. They're not going to do that to Sting. That would get me interested. But as things stand right now, when I saw the Young Bucks come out and I realized where they apparently are going with this, my reaction was indifference, which is kind of how I feel about the Young Bucks right now. Indifferent. But that would get me interested in seeing that match. And I hope that that's the direction they go in, or maybe this is just a swerve. But I don't think they send the Bucks out there unless that's the direction we're headed in for Revolution. So we'll have to see if, if in fact, that ends up happening. Samoa Joe is also on the show tonight, the new AEW World Champion, his first live promo. The King was here to take his throne. And coming out of the show tonight, he already has three challengers. Four, if you count Wardlow, since 
The Undisputed Kingdom have already made it clear Wardlow's going to be going after the World Heavyweight title. But Joe comes out of the show tonight very much like MJF. MJF had a target on his back. At any given moment, it felt like he had three or four different people gunning for him. Samoa Joe, after one night on the show, already has at least three people gunning for him. And he's wrestling next week. He's defending the championship against Hook. So We'll talk about that Samoa Joe segment. We'll talk about uh, Chris Jericho coming out to make the save for his partner and having his music play to drown out the crowd. You're not fooling me with that shit. I know exactly why they did what they did. But on the whole, you know, as far as tonight's show, this this was not uh, this was not a home run show. Again, I'm I'm willing to give the eight man tags a pass because they were booked by a 12 year old. Again, not not anything that I was really into personally. Uh, but we open with a hot match, and we close with the obligatory crazy match with Darby Allen just killing himself, which is what Darby Allen does. Uh, I didn't think this was one of the stronger episodes of Dynamite, but again, part of the episode, I have to give it a pass just because of the circumstances. Anyway, this is your Dynamite review. We're going to get into everything here. Please do like and subscribe. 400 likes is the minimum. If we hit 400, we will do our Be the Booker segment later on. Super Chats are open. Chris AXC coming in here with a $5. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And uh, you didn't think I was going to let this pass, did you? You didn't think I was going to let this pass without saying something. That right there, well, behind, uh, behind Elias and Kevin Owens, they'll disappear in a second. But that is Brandon Delgado, and uh, you may know him better in the chat as Rican Son. Brandon was in attendance at Daly's Place tonight. And uh, how's that for product placement right there? Representing the sound of holding up that Solomonster sign, Solomonster Bebe. Brandon, thank you, brother. I hope you had fun tonight. And uh, I appreciate the shout. Very, very kind to you. Representing the podcast right there. I mean, look, you could, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better shot. <laughs> it, it doesn't get any more up close than that right there. So, Brandon, thank you very much, man. Now, Dynamite tonight. It opened with a hot match here with Hangman Adam Page going one-on-one -on -one with Claudio Castagnoli. The fans, by the way, I should mention the fact that the fans at Daly's Place were wearing jackets, uh, be even though it's Florida, because it's fucking cold. And Taz at one point was complaining about how cold it was on commentary. So even in Florida, you can't escape the winter weather. And yet here in New York, this weekend, it's going to be almost 60. Up is down and down is up. The world is upside down. I don't know what's going on here. We have, the, we have the weather that Florida would normally have, and Florida has the weather that New York would normally have. I'll take it. I'll take the 60, but my God, the rain we got yesterday, it was like a gorilla monsoon outside. It was crazy. So Paige went right after Claudio. Claudio had the second entrance. He went after him as soon as he came out. Referee tried to step in between them. Hangman was in the corner, but Claudio poked him in the eye, and the referee was shielded at the time, so... He didn't see it. Castagnoli performed an early giant swing on Hangman, and then he put him in the sharpshooter. Page reached for the ropes, and Claudio countered into a crossface that he was able to escape. Page and Claudio, they ended up at ringside, and Hangman took a swig of uh, someone's beer at ringside, and then he tossed Claudio back into the ring. Page charged at him, and as he charged at him, Claudio, the beast that he is, he pressed this man over his head. He got the gorilla press, and he gorilla press slammed him over the top rope onto the ramp. Because at Daly's Place, they have the elevated ramp, that short aisle way, the elevated ramp that goes from the stage to the ring. And he gorilla pressed him out of the ring and onto the ramp. And he took a hell of a fall. And that took us into the picture and picture break. So after a charging double stomp on the stage, Claudio, he kept Hangman grounded in the ring until. Page wanted a buckshot. He didn't get a buckshot, though. He ate a big boot, and that put him back on the ramp. So both men now were over by the entrance, by the stage, and they're slugging it out, and Hangman got Claudio up against the ropes, and then he put some distance between them, and then he did the charge down the ramp and clotheslined him over the top rope, 
back into the ring. He went for another buckshot lariat, but it got countered into a very nice pop-up uppercut by Claudio for a near fall. Claudio was toying with him, which only pissed off Hangman. Both men spilled out to the floor. Hangman wanted a moonsault off the apron, but Claudio caught him, and then he, with him on his shoulder in a power slam position, he plowed this man into the concrete wall. Now, if you were watching the show, you know what I'm talking about. They, when they shoot the show, there's an angle where they have one section of fans that are kind of by themselves, and they have the uh, Tron is above them, and there's like a little ledge. In front. That's actually the section that Brandon was in with his solid monster sign. And so you have that little section of fans, and the, but there's a wall. It's like a concrete barrier right below them. And then the fans are on that, like, top level. So he plowed him into the concrete barrier with a running power slam. Then he went for it again, but this time when he went to charge in for it again, Paige countered into a DDT on the floor. So when he got back up, Hangman climbed up onto the stage, onto that little platform in front of that fan section. And he delivered a moonsault down onto Claudio. Now back inside, Claudio uh, caught another dive. Page, though, he was able to wiggle free. Claudio had him in a position for something. He was able to wiggle free, and he hit a tombstone for a two count. Hangman wanted a dead eye, but Claudio countered and dropped him face first onto the top turnbuckle. And he started firing off uppercuts and then a short arm lariat. He wanted the neutralizer, but Hangman countered into the dead eye, only got two. And then Hangman wanted another springboard clothesline. Claudio caught him with an uppercut in midair. Both men went to the ropes. Claudio wanted an avalanche recola bomb. That was the first time I noticed uh, Brandon in the crowd. Page, though, turned it into a hurricane rana, and then Hangman followed up with not one but two. Buckshot Larius. The first one put Claudio down just briefly, and then the second one put him down for good. He picks up the win. Uh, an excellent opener with a hot crowd. This was a fine way to kick off the show, and it was a necessary win for Hangman because, as we saw on the show last week, clearly they were setting up Hangman to challenge for the AEW world title. I said last week, I think we're getting a triple threat match at Revolution. I think it's going to be Samoa Joe defending his title against Hangman and Swerve Strickland. At the very least, we're going to get Hangman Swerve 3 on TV to decide on a number one contender. I mean, they may do that match anyway. And then we end up with no winner, and that takes us to a three-way at the pay-per-view. But whatever the situation is, if this man is going to possibly be challenging for the world title, he can't be losing here. So this was a necessary win for Hangman Page. Blackpool Combat Club, though, I will say they've been taking some losses lately. Claudio here tonight, but we've had John Moxley, right? He lost to... Eddie Kingston in the finals of the Continental Classic, and he lost in his triple threat match at Wrestle Kingdom. Brian Danielson lost to Eddie Kingston in the Continental Classic, and then he went to the Tokyo Dome, and he lost to Okada. So the Blackpool Combat Club has a, uh, a losing streak going. Highlights aired of the late Brody Lee. As I mentioned before, tonight's show felt in part like, a, like another tribute show almost to him. And they showed highlights from his brief run in the company, and all of his matches happened at Daly's Place. And in the, the TNT title win over Cody Rhodes as well. They showed him putting down Cody and winning the TNT championship from him. Uh, Excalibur referred to him as the greatest TNT champion in history. And again, it really sucks that he never had the chance to perform in front of actual fans. Excalibur said that he will live in the hearts of everyone in AEW, including his hand-picked protégés in Preston Vance and Anna Jay, who they said would be in separate eight-person tags on this show. And that's what we had up next, the first of those eight-person tag matches, this time with the men. Now, these people were personally, as I understand it, they were personally hand-picked by Negative One. So Brody Lee Jr. is the one who played matchmaker for these two tag matches. Here it was Adam Copeland, Orange Cassidy, Dustin Rhodes, and Preston Vance, who I know he got very close to uh, after his father passed away, taking on Lance Archer, Brian Cage, and the Gates of Agony. So just forget that uh, Preston Vance, he made the negative one cry, and he attacked the Dark Order. 
but for the purposes of this match, we'll just pretend that didn't happen. Uh, but this was Adam Copeland's debut here at Daly's Place, and he looked like he was having a good time. Cassidy was taking a lot of punishment uh, through a commercial break. Archer launched Cassidy clear across the ring, and he followed up with a step-up knee in the corner. Archer wanted the locomotion splashes, but Jose, the assistant, tripped him up the third go-round. And so Jake the Snake Roberts, who was out there, I mean, this jacket that he was wearing, too. I mean, Jake was dressed to the nines here on this show. He, oh, Jake doesn't get to appear on Dynamite very often, so he wanted to, he wanted to look his best. He was outside. He didn't like the fact that Jose tripped up Lance Archer. So Jake walked over to Jose. He punched him in the face. Jose took this uh, huge bump for him on the floor. So Cassidy managed a uh, round-the-world DDT, made the hot tag to Preston Vance. And Vance ran wild on everybody. Bishop Cone, he ducked a discus lariat, but Vance answered with a ripcord cutter. The match broke down at this point. Cage dropped Dustin with an F5. He tried for an F5 on Copeland. Copeland landed on his feet, and he countered into uh, an Impaler DDT. Cohn dropped Copeland with a gut buster. Cassidy, though, was there with an orange punch. Lance Archer hit a boss man slam, and then we got some friendly fire between him and Toa Leona. So this led to Brian Cage taking out his own partner, with a clothesline to the floor, but he turned around into an Adam Copeland spear, and then they missed the finish. They missed the finish of the match, which was Preston Vance delivering a Brody Lee-esque discus lariat to Bishop Cohn to win the match for his team. They did show a replay of it, thankfully. They showed a replay of it, but I, I did think to myself... Him, sir. Are we sure that Tony Khan did not bring Kevin Dunn in after the first of the year? You know, Kevin Dunn's a free agent as of midnight on January 1st. Are we sure? Can we be sure that Tony Khan did not make a phone call to Kevin Dunn? How do you, how do you miss the finish of this match? It's the most important part. Anyway, this was just a uh, crowd-pleasing match. Uh, Vance went over as uh, the guy who was handpicked by Brody Lee. You know, just, again, he was the protege of Brody Lee. And I would imagine this was just a one-off uh, as far as doing something with Preston Vance because he's not involved in anything uh, on Dynamite. I don't think that's going to change just because of this match tonight. Uh, I don't think it's the start of a face turn with him or anything like that again. He was booked by a child. We got a feel-good moment. Leave it alone. That's all it is. Renee was backstage with Bullet Club Gold. Switchblade Jay White said that anything the Undisputed Kingdom can do, the Bang Bang Gang could do better, including going after some gold. That's when Billy Gunn and the acclaimed, they walked in, the trios champs. Anthony Bowen said, look, if we are a united force, we can win all the gold. Except these. You can't get these titles. But we can win all the gold. And they suggested forming basically a a super group, and I think, what, what was the name that he called it? The Bang Bang Scissor Gang? As if we need Jay White involved in this. So anyway, they said they'll think about it. Austin Gunn was left trying to basically explain that, uh, I, Austin Gunn seems to be the only one who's really down for the idea. They played that up in the last segment we saw last time. Where he was, he was the only member of, of Bullet Club Gold who was like, well, you know, it's not a bad idea. So he seems to be the one who's mostly uh, considering this proposal. I don't know. You know, Jay White lost to MJF at full gear. And it just seems he's directionless ever since then. I'd like to see them come up with something a little bit better and a little bit more, uh, you know, a story of more value than this for someone like Switchblade Jay White. This is not what I was hoping he would be involved in as we started 2024. But then we had our new AEW world champion, Samoa Joe, making his first live appearance since beating MJF for the world title at World's End. Joe came out, he was in a suit, and he has returned the AEW world title uh, to its native black strap. No more 
Burberry strap. It's the old AEW world title, but on a black strap. He said he stands before us tonight as our new AEW world champion. And he got chance of thank you, Joe. He said no thanks are needed. He was destined for this. He said tonight we make some changes to the championship challenging protocol. He said, when you win this title, it makes you a marked man. And he even hears that the devil is after him. But he runs things here in Duval County. No more will you have to come out here to whine about your misfortunes or go on social media and make your hoe-ass comments. I wasn't sure if he was referring to his boss when he made that comment. But no longer will you go on social media and talk shit. No, he says, you bring your record and your reputation, you submit it to the championship committee. And if you are deemed worthy, you get an express pass to walk that aisle, get in this ring, and have me stomp your ass out in front of anybody that has ever cheered for you. He says, for the new championship, uh, the new championship era is here, and for all of you who want a piece of me, your champion will be waiting. And then we heard, whose house? Here comes Swerve Strickland, here comes Prince Nana. In fact, the entire Mogul Embassy, including the ones who just got their asses beat, they came back out on stage. Swerve had a mic in his hand. He said that uh, this was the first time for him here in uh, Daly's Place. But they're going to call this uh, whose house? Everybody said Swerve's house. He said he told Hangman Page that it was nothing personal between them, but he was after his spot. And what did he do? He said he took it. So he's going to reiterate the same thing to Joe. He says this is not a personal thing between them. And he's going to take it. However, after he takes that title from him, and when Joe chooses to make this a personal thing, he would be more than happy to. So they were interrupted by Hangman Page's music, and Page walked to the ring with a mic in his hand. He was eyeballing Swerve the entire time. He says, well, boys, if we're out here calling our shots, making New Year's resolutions, I'll make mine. He said, in 2023, I beat John Moxley in a Texas death match. I reunited with the elite at Blood and Guts and Anarchy in the Arena. And he found Swerve. But the one thing he lost sight of was the AEW World Championship. And in 2024, he will make it his. So he got up in Swerve's face. Prince Nana pulled Swerve out of the ring so there was no physicality between them. Mogul Embassy left. Hangman turned back to Samoa Joe, got up in his face, and he told Joe he had not forgotten what he did to him, and he's going to take that title from him for it. And Hangman left the ring. Joe was left all alone. And so he held up his title for all to see. When all of a sudden we heard Hook's music. Yes, the same hook that uh, Jinder Mahal does not know ho- who Hook is. So uh, Jinder, Jinder will have to be educated about who Hook is. All Jinder has to do is look up, apparently, because they <laughs> aimed the cameras up into the air and they had a hook signal. Now, I admit, I have not been following all of his matches on Rampage or wh- wherever he's been wrestling recently, but I don't know. Is this a new thing? <laughs> Maybe they only did it because they were in Daly's place and they were outside. I don't know, but. Now we have like a, like a bat signal, only it says hook. They call it the hook signal. So Hook walks out. He circles the ring before he gets inside. He called out Joe, for those who don't know, in a pre-tape segment on Collision this past weekend. It was a, it was a brief pre-tape. He was outside somewhere. He was in his bubble jacket. And he had challenged Joe to a championship match. So now here he is. He came nose to nose with Samoa Joe. By the way, I'm old enough to remember when his father managed Samoa Joe in TNA. And now here's his son coming out and challenging Joe to a title match. He told Joe one week. He put his finger in the air, and he wasn't talking about Roman Reigns. He put his finger in the air. He said one week. One week. And he's coming for Joe. He's coming for that title. One week from tonight. So Samoa Joe has everybody gunning for him. Again, like I said, MJF, it was the same thing, right? It was Jay White, and then the Wardlow vignette started airing, and it was Samoa Joe at Grand Slam. I mean, he had people coming from every angle after him and his title. And now Samoa Joe, he's been champion for, what, a week? A little over a week? And this guy's got him coming from every angle here. Hook has a 28-1 record. 
So Hook has been racking up wins. He has not been racking up that many wins on Dynamite, so I can see where people wouldn't really know that he's got a 28-1 record. But he does have a 28-1 record. And so just like that, Samoa Joe has got at least three, if not four challengers, if you want to throw Wardlow in there, uh, coming for the AEW world title. So the Hook match is happening. They confirmed it later in the show. It will be Samoa Joe defending his title on Dynamite next Wednesday uh, against Hook. And uh, as I said earlier, Hangman, Swerve, probably going to get the three-way I would think at Revolution. It may not be the main event. Uh, and I'm, I'm not expecting Joe to lose the title this quickly. I hope he doesn't. But with Sting's retirement match being on that show, that will probably be closing out the show. And honestly, if it were me, I would let Joe run with the title for a little while. You know, I was of the mind before Joe won the belt. Swerve, MJF, Revolution, that's your main event, right? That and the Sting match, that's your double bill at Revolution. Then MJF lost the belt, and Joe won it. And I was very happy to see Joe win the belt. The last thing I want to do is see Joe drop the belt two months after he won it. Joe's walking out there tonight in that suit. He's talking about, here's the way things are going to be done from now on. He looks like a fucking boss out there. And who knows, it may be the only run that he's got with that title. I'd like to see them give him some time with it. Swerve is going to get his moment this year. It's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen at Revolution, I think it'll happen at Double or Nothing. And there's no harm in pushing it back a little bit until Vegas in May and doing it there. But give Joe a run. Let Joe have some time with this title. He walked out there tonight, and he looked like a champion. And it would suck for them to take that title away from him that quickly. Remember when he won the TNT title? That's basically what they did. They had him drop the belt. It was a year ago on Dynamite to Darby. I don't think he had it for very long. So give him some time with it. Joe also, by the way, he mentioned uh, a championship committee making the decisions from now on. I, I don't know if that was just a throwaway line. I would assume not. So they're going with this idea of their... Now, they didn't say who would be on the championship committee. They just said that there is a championship committee. And they'll be the ones making the decisions from now on. So I wonder if that means no more of these random eliminator matches to crown number one contenders if we have a championship committee. They showed highlights of Deanna Perrazzo's debut on last week's show when she came out and upstaged Mariah May after she made her in-ring debut. Backstage, Renee was with Timeless Tony Storm, Luther, and Mariah May. Mariah asked Tony, she was so excited, she asked Tony if she had time to see her match. And Tony said that she was uh, sent her screener and she uh, didn't see a single bit of it. And she started asking her questions. She said, Did you do an arm drag? And Renee said, uh, Actually, I was referring to AEW's newest signee. And Tony cut her off and said, Wendy Richter. If you didn't see that moment from the media scrum, uh, there were some embarrassing moments from that media scrum. That was the best moment from the media scrum, was when Tony Storm is sitting there with Tony Khan. And uh, somebody in the scrum asked Tony a question about her next challenger or something. And uh, Tony was out there just kind of freelancing. And she, she stood up and she said, Wendy Richter. She said, I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> I mean, she plays this, but you, you can't say that whether you like the character or not. And I love it. I think it's fucking great. The one thing you can't say is that this woman is not committed to this character. When she said Wendy Richter, I fucking died. So that's where the Wendy Richter uh, quip comes from. Renee said, no, 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 it's Diana Perrazzo. And she said that she was coming for your title. And then Mariah May piped it and said, uh, oh, yeah, and uh, you know, she kicked me in the face. So Tony handed Mariah a chocolate to uh, shut her up. And Tony said, Deanna Perrazzo, Deanna Perrazzo, that sounds familiar. She said, it sounds Italian. And she asked Luther to set her up a meeting with this, uh, Don this D Donna Palazzo. Set up a meeting. She said, until then, chin up, tits out. And she asked for her final line. Mariah told her, watch for the shoe. And then Tony chewed her out for stealing her line. And this popped Taz on commentary. It popped me, too. But a pop Taz on commentary. You can see the resentment building a little bit each week in, in Mariah May. Every time that Tony Storm blows her off, you can see the resentment building. Because there's a longer story being told here between those two. You can't tell it now because Mariah May, I mean, she just made her in-ring debut a week ago. Uh, 
but every time they do a segment like that, that resentment is building and building and building a little bit more. We had Sammy Guevara one-on-one -on -one with absolute Ricky Starks. Uh, Guevara and Chris Jericho, for those who don't know, they are wrestling Ricky Starks and Big Bill this Saturday for the AEW Tag Team Titles. Uh, it's going to be a street fight at Battle of the Belts. This is a busy night on Saturday. So we have Collision from 8 to 10. From 10 to 11 is Battle of the Belts 9, which is where this match is taking place. It's basically three hours of AEW on Saturday. New Japan has its Battle in the Valley show, and TNA has its Hard to Kill pay-per-view. And they're still hyping a major signing. Some big name is going to show up at the TNA pay-per-view, and I don't know, I thought I saw somewhere where supposedly they said it's not a female star. I don't know if that's confirmed or not, because uh, there's an obvious free agent out there that it could potentially be. Apparently, it's not going to be that person. Uh, so I don't know who it's going to be, but all that is going on on Saturday night. So it's going to be a busy night. Anyway, Sammy here at the beginning of this match, he hit an Orihara moonsault to Ricky Starks on the floor that got most of Ricky's shoulder. And Ricky immediately grabbed his shoulder. Thankfully, he's okay. That was a little scary. They ended up back inside and then out on the apron. And Ricky delivered a double underhook slam at the Angels' wings to Sammy on the apron where he lifted him up, got him about halfway into the air, and then he turned with him and then dropped him and drove him down face first onto the apron. So that was wild, and that took us into the picture-in-picture -picture break. And it was all Ricky throughout the break. Starks tried a TKO. Guevara, though, spun out into a super kick. And Sammy went up top. Starks grabbed his foot, and he clobbered him with some punches to the side of the head. Guevara fought free. He tried a moonsault. Starks, though, caught him with the double boots on the way down. Caught him flush right in the face. And then he had a sit-out powerbomb for a two-count. Starks sprinted, but he ended up sliding face-first into the corner after Guevara leapfrogged him. Sammy tried for the go-to-hell, but Ricky landed on his feet. He countered into a jackknife pin attempt. Only got a two-count. Starks wanted a spear. Guevara dodged it, hit another kick, and then rolled up Ricky for the surprise win. He just rolled him up out of nowhere and pinned one half of the tag team champions, which I would imagine uh, does not bode well for he and Jericho's chances on Saturday. Because if you beat Ricky, of all people, you pin Ricky Starks here, and then you beat them for the belts on Saturday, well, boy, does that bury Ricky Starks. So I would think that bodes well for him and Big Bill retaining on Saturday, but the match was good. It was too short to be anything great, though, because it just felt to me like they're saving all the good stuff for Battle of the Belts, so they didn't want to give too much away here. So it was good. It was fine, but, I mean, it was, you know, probably half as, half as great as we know a match between these two could be. We didn't get that match here on this show. When the match was over, though, Guevara and Starks, shockingly, they shook hands and it looked like Ricky was being you know he was being very magnanimous here but of course it was all just a ploy because as they're shaking hands here comes Big Bill and Bill ambushes Sammy from behind and then we hear Judas they play Judas and out comes Chris Jericho in his leather jacket and he's got Floyd the baseball bat with him he drops Big Bill with a code breaker and the springboard drop kick on the apron that he does Starks and Guevara, they continued brawling around uh, the ringside area. Jericho and Bill, they brawled into the fans. They brawled up into the crowd. And they left Jericho's music to play out throughout all of this. They never cut the music off. So as all four men are brawling, again, they're over here. These guys are over here. They let Judas just play through, clearly to mask any potential boos or chance of NDA that might ring out in the crowd. You will not never convince me that this was done for any other reason other than to mask a potential negative reaction to Chris Jericho. Now, there were people, a lot of people, who were singing the song because they liked the song. But they were singing the song at World's End, too, until the song stopped. Then they weren't cheering anymore. That's the only reason they did that was because they were afraid of the reaction that he might get, and so they just let the song play. Not going to be able to play the song, though, throughout the entire match on Saturday. 
Although they did do that, I guess. They were playing, uh, remember the first Anarchy in the Arena? They left the music playing for like five or six minutes. Not going to be able to do that at Battle of the Belts. But if you think that they let that music play for any other reason, then you're a fool. So then we had our other eight-person tag team match of the night, this time with the ladies. It was Thunder Rosa, Chris Statlander, Anna Jay, and Willow Nightingale taking on Soraya, Ruby Soho, Sky Blue, and the TBS champion, Julia Hart. Stokely Hathaway was at ringside holding a sign that said, Let Stoke Manage You Stat, as uh, Statlander was going around ringside. They're doing an angle where he's, he's lobbying. He wants to manage Chris Statlander, so that's a little side story they have going on. Uh, Ruby tried early on to uh, talk some shit to Anna, who uh, popped her with a forearm and a kick in the corner. So we had some quick tags on the babyface side. Ruby took a series of uh, quick offense, with Thunder Rosa being the one who was standing tall at the end of it. Ruby floated over Rosa and then fell into her corner, and Julia made the tag, and she attacked Thunder Rosa from behind. And the heels came back, they returned the favor, they all took turns stomping on Rosa before she fought back, and she tagged in Willow, who connected on a corner splash. Aubrey Edwards was distracted, that allowed Cameron to uh, trip up Willow Nightingale. Cameron, of course, for those who don't know, Cameron, Harley Cameron, is the blonde who's out there now with Soraya and Ruby. This was an early birthday gift from Soraya to Ruby Soho. Yesterday was Ruby's birthday. And so she got her a blonde as a birthday gift. How come nobody can get me a blonde as a birthday gift? I mean, I am a blonde, but how come nobody ever gets me a birthday gift like that? I'd like a blonde. She got Ruby a blonde for a birthday gift, and she's like this crazy person, and so now they're all together. So when I say Cameron, I'm talking about Harley Cameron, not Cameron from WWE. Anyway, Willow dropped to Julia and Sky Blue with a double clothesline. Statlander made the hot tag. She cleaned house. She laid out Soraya with a spinning fisherman's driver for two. The match broke down. As the eight-person tag early, earlier in the show did, where that match broke down, so too did this one. Babyfaces hit a quadruple suplex. They did a quadruple superplex spot in this match. Or well, not superplex, but in the middle of the ring, a suplex. And then each woman took turns hitting a big move. It ended with Statlander hitting Soraya with a rolling German, and that left Anna Jay and Julia, the legal women. They were staring each other down. And Anna Jay got her Queen Slayer finish applied. Did not see Sky Blue make the blind tag, though. All this did was allow Anna to sink in the Queen Slayer on her. And she got the tap out from Sky Blue to win the match for her team. So again, like the eight-man tag earlier on, this was uh, the Dark Order protege going over in the end. It was Preston Vance earlier. Here it was Anna Jay. Uh, again, I reiterate, the match was made by a 12-year-old. The action was okay, but... You know, I didn't really care for it. Just, you know, throwing these people together in these uh, eight-man tags didn't, didn't do much for me. But at least here, I'll say this about this match. I can't say this about the men's match. But I will say this about the women's match. It does look like we may be setting up here, based on the finish, to Anna Jay getting a TBS title shot against Julia Hart. Because they were, they were eyeing each other when the match was over. So at least we might get a title match out of this. I don't think we're getting Preston Vance challenging for a title anytime soon. We had Roderick Strong out with Adam Cole and the rest of the Undisputed Kingdom for a match with the Bounty Hunter, Brian Keith. Still looking for his first win, they said. He'll have to keep looking because he didn't get it tonight. Keith caught Roddy with a, uh, a boot. Fired off some chops, sent him to the floor with another big boot. Yeah, he got a bit of offense here in this match, but it was all for nothing. Uh, Roddy hit an angle slam. He wanted a superplex. Keith fought off with a uh, diamond dust, and then he wanted a tiger driver. Strong popped up, though, hit a uh, leaping knee strike, and then the end of heartache backbreaker for the victory. So after the match, Adam Cole in his walking boot. Sits in a chair in the ring. Stop me if you've heard this before. He sits in the ring. He's surrounded by all the members of the Undisputed Kingdom. And he said he meant what he said when he said this place was about to change. 
So many people are obsessed with earning people's respect. They want to earn your respect. He goes, we're not interested in that because we deserve it. We're not interested in trying to earn your respect. Said Roderick Strong is a 20-year veteran. He is the greatest pro wrestler alive today. And as far as he's concerned, the AEW International Championship has his name on it. Then he said, Taven and Bennett, not only the greatest Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions of all time, but our reigning Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. He said they have never, ever gotten the respect that they deserve. They will go down as one of the greatest tag teams that has, <laughs> one of the greatest tag teams that has ever lived. That's pretty funny. And of course, he said, the monster, the dominator, one of the most vicious men in AEW history, Wardlow. And now that Wardlow is surrounded by people that actually respect him when the time is right, we said, we are going to win the AEW World Championship. Because remember what Adam Cole said in the first promo that he did. He said that if Wardlow wins, or when Wardlow wins the title, he's going to hand it over to me. And Wardlow kind of laughed it off. So he said, boys and girls, say hello to your new home. Or should I say your new kingdom? And do me a favor, make sure you get comfortable because we're going to be here for a very, very long time. So they repeated the same promo from last week. It was exactly the same promo. Last week, he sat in the ring in a chair, just like he did here, surrounded by the members of his faction. And he went one by one and told us what the mission statement is for each person. Roddy, you're going to be the international champion. Taven and Bennett are the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. Wardlow is going to be the AEW World Champion. It's exactly what they did here. He offered nothing new. I think Cole lives in Florida, so at least they didn't have to fly him in. But why even bother having him travel to the show on one leg? He could have just stayed home. Could have skipped a week. Brought him back next week. What was the point of this? We already got the promo last week. Did we really need it a second time? Are we going to get it at the end of every single match that they have where Taven and Bennett, when they win their next match, is he going to cut the same promo again? I don't know, man. I don't know. No mention of MJF. MJF was, uh, apparently, I think MJF is away, or so I heard. I believe he's away on a vacation in Costa Rica. But he is also deciding on what his course of action is going to be as far as his injuries. Is he going to have surgery? Is he going to rehab? What's he going to do? I talked about it on the podcast on Sunday. I haven't seen the man's x-rays. I don't know how severe the labrum tear is and his injuries are. If they're serious enough, just have surgery. You know, I mean, don't. It, it's a situation where he's young enough and he's an important enough part of this company. You don't want to half-ass something like this. If he's got serious injuries, whether it be his arm, his hip, that need to be addressed, and surgery will take care of it, even if it keeps him out for up to a year, to have the surgery. It's not like this company is hurting for talent. It fucks up this entire storyline if he doesn't come back for a while, but you've already got Adam Cole who can't even walk. And they made him the devil. So he's going to be hobbling around now for the next four months. So what difference does it make? They got Will Ospreay coming in. You look at all the other talent they got, right? Swerve, I think, will end up winning the title. Samoa Joe is the champion. You've got Hangman. You've got Darby. You've got Sammy. You've got all these different people. The House of Black. You've got Brian Danielson. You've got Eddie Kingston. The company is in good hands talent-wise. Just get better. Don't do the opposite of what Kota Ibushi did. That would be my advice. Unsolicited advice to MJF. Okay, not knowing exactly the, the severity of the injuries. Do the opposite of what Kota Ibushi did, please. We don't, we don't need another Kota Ibushi. He's too important to this company to not get 100% healthy and come back strong. Renee was backstage with their latest signing, the Virtuosa, Diana Perrazzo, former Impact Knockouts champion. She said that she set her sights on Tony Storm, and if she wants to pretend, if Tony wants to pretend that she doesn't know who she is, then that's fine. She'll have her people send Tony's people her screener after she makes her debut on Collision this Saturday. 
And before she could tell us exactly who she was going to be making her debut against, Red Velvet showed up. Red Velvet does the whole... I think of Daly's place in Red Velvet. I think of Red Velvet and Cody Rhodes against the Jade Cargill and Shaquille O'Neal because Brandy was pregnant and couldn't wrestle, so Red Velvet took her place. Red Velvet was basically, you know, she was the substitute for Brandy Rhodes. That was her big moment, right? She got to share the ring with Shaq. The Red Velvet. So she comes in to camera view, and Red Velvet says she'll also be making her collision debut this Saturday. And she suggested they wrestle each other. And here's my question. If she was already going to be making her debut on Collision, why, I mean, why issue the challenge? I mean, didn't she already have an opponent? Evidently not. So she went and challenged Deanna Perrazzo to a match, and I guess that's the match we're going to get. We're going to get Red Velvet against Deanna Perrazzo. So they're vaulting Deanna Perrazzo here, day one. They're already letting you know that before long, maybe by revolution, they are vaulting this woman into contention for Tony Storm's AW uh, Women's World Title. But you know she's got to win some matches first, you know, especially if uh, Mister Cage Match is going to be on Twitter arguing with people about win loss records and complaining about Jinder Mahal doing nothing and being gifted a World Heavyweight Title match on Raw next Monday then obviously it's important that the person rack up some wins before they challenge for a championship, hence the match with Red Velvet this weekend, and she'll have to rack up some more wins, because that wouldn't make any sense now, would it? So this will be her first win on her march to the eventual match with Tony Storm. And then we had our main event. We had our main event of Sting and Darby Allin and Sting's Curtain call here in the state of Florida. I, I mean, unless he wrestles on TV between now and Revolution and they're back in Florida, I don't think they are. This was probably the last time that we will see Sting in the ring in the state of Florida. Ric Flair was out there as well. He was in their corner. Sting and Darby taking on Kanosuke Takeshita and Powerhouse Hobbs in a tornado tag team match. Falls count anywhere. Anything goes. All the bells and whistles that you would expect in a Sting match because it's pretty much been. Like that every match he's had so far in AEW. Jim Ross joined on commentary for the main event. The action immediately spilled out onto uh, the stage, into the crowd. Actually, it was into the crowd first. Sting got Hobbs on an equipment case and sent him for a ride. Back at ringside, Darby and Takeshita, they started going at it. And Darby climbed up to the top rope. He hit a coffin drop and Takeshita caught him. And he did the Chaos Theory rolling German suplex on the floor. He dropped Darby right on the back of his neck. He folded this fucker up. <laughs> I mean, he just folded him up on the floor as Flair just stood there and watched. So after the break, Sting saved Darby from a near fall in the ring, but he could not save him from being hurled across the ring. They did the spot where... <laughs> Takeshita grabs Darby. I think it was one of them had his feet. The other one had Darby's arms. And they swung him back and forth like a pendulum. And then they let him go. And they threw him across the ring. And somehow Darby was able to twist his body in midair. He did a few revolutions, a few spins before he landed. And he smacked his, his face, his mouth, right on the bottom rope. I mean, just... The, the beating this man, he's a human, you know what he is? He's a human crash test dummy. That's what he is. You remember the old commercials of the crash test dummies? They put him in the car, strap him in, drive him into a wall. That's Darby Allen. So with Darby down, Sting was all by himself. He went right at the heels. He had a stinger splash in the corner to Hobbs, but when he turned around, he walked right into a knee strike from Kanosuke Takeshita. So now Ric Flair says, well, I got to get involved here. I can, I can contain myself no longer. Takes his jacket off. Flair climbs into the ring because, of course, he did. He delivered chops to Hobbs, who no-sold them, but then he thumbed him in the eye. Sting clotheslined Takeshita out of the ring, and Darby followed that with a suicide dive to the floor, which knocked Takeshita backwards into that concrete barrier. All four men took the fight now to the stage. Darby was on Takeshita's back. He had a sleeper hold applied. Takeshita backed up into 
there was a, a metal guardrail, because again, they had that fan section off to the side. So there's a guardrail there. And he backed Darby into the guardrail. That broke the hole. Now here comes Takeshita in with a running knee strike. Darby moves out of the way. And Takeshita goes knee first into the metal barricade. So now Darby says, well, it's time to take to the skies. And so Darby Allen, he climbs one level up on top of the guardrail. I don't know how many feet up he was. And he dove off for a coffin drop and took down Takeshita. It looked like he barely grazed Takeshita. I mean, he pretty much just dove off and landed mostly on the fucking stage. And Takeshita went down with him. Meanwhile, Hobbs got Sting up on his shoulder. And he's carrying Sting and he's walking across the, uh, the staging right in front of that fan section. There's like a, a ledge. It's not a big ledge, a few inches. So he's walking along, Sting wiggles free, and he gets Hobbs in position for a scorpion death drop. And it just so happens that he wiggled free and he got him in position for the death drop right in the area where down below, in that very location, there were two tables that happened to be sitting right next to each other. And I hold my breath every time I see Sting is about to do something very stupid because the man is 64 years old. Sting proceeds to execute a scorpion death drop off the ledge. The idea was that they would go through the two tables. They missed the first table. And they went through the second table. And Sting crashed to the floor. Back of his head smacks the floor. So now both men are down. And Sting places his, his arm or his hand on top of uh, Hobbs' body. And he pinned him to win the match for his team. They gave Sting the win here. Sting was never losing. I don't think Sting is losing at all. I think Sting is retiring undefeated. But if the man is going to lose a match, he's going to lose his last match. He'll do the honors on the way out. He's not losing two months before his revolution match. So Sting and Darby winning was not a surprise. Sting doing something stupid in the match, also not a surprise. Darby Allen doing something stupid in the match, even less of a surprise. So now it looks like Sting may have rung his bell. He might be hurt. Doc Sampson comes over to talk to him because Sting is down. He's communicating with him. Uh, Sting ended up on the, uh, he was laying, I think, on the ring apron. Darby comes over. Darby's talking to him. Sting is still down. Now I'm thinking, okay, something might be wrong here. Eventually, Sting was able to make it to his feet. He was walking around. He seemed to be okay. He, I mean, he could be concussed for all we know. Who knows? But he seemed to be okay. Not, nothing seemed to be broken or anything like that. So he got back up to his feet. Tony Schiavone now is in the ring. He's in the ring with Sting, with Darby, and with Ric Flair. He goes over to Sting and he asks Sting, who is your final opponent going to be at Revolution in your final match at the Greensboro Coliseum? And before Sting could answer the question, he was interrupted by the return of the Young Bucks. And so here comes Matt and Nick Jackson who now have, uh, they've, they've shaved their beards to where now they have the creepy McMahon mustache. One was wearing black, the other was dressed in white. They walk out onto the stage, never said anything. Sting and Darby and Flair, they're looking at them, they're looking back at them. We had a stare down for about two and a half minutes. This lingered for a while. There was no promo, there was no official declaration of, this being the match at Revolution, but they sure wanted you to think that this was going to be the match at Revolution. And that's how they went off the air. As I said before, the idea of the Young Bucks being Sting's final opponent at Revolution against Sting and Darby does not excite me. It just doesn't. And the only way it would really interest me is if they go with the idea that Sting is going to be challenging for the tag team titles in his final match. It's the one thing Sting and Darby have not done in this run, is go for the tag team titles. There is a story to tell there. The story doesn't just have to be, oh, it's Sting's last match. Is he going to win or is he going to lose? Yeah, I mean, it's a very simple story you can do, but I like the idea of sweetening the pot a little bit. And if you really want to send Sting off in a major way, what better way than to have him challenging for a title and winning the titles with the man who basically gave him Three more years of his career. Sting has had nothing but glowing things to say about Darby Allen. Darby Allen has been a hell of a partner for Sting. I mean, he, he has sacrificed himself 
in pretty much every match that these two have ever had together. Uh, they have made for a great team. I would love to see them win those tag team titles and get that big happy moment with the confetti falling and they get Sting up on their shoulders and they're celebrating with him and what a great moment it would be. And then you could always you know, vacate the belts after and have a tournament because Tony Khan loves doing those anyway. So it's very simple as far as what do you do with the tag belts. That's it. You vacate them, you have a tournament, you crown new tag team champions. Very simple. Now, the Young Bucks are heels. Ricky Starks and Big Bill are heels. I'm not so sure that they're going to be losing those titles to Jericho and Sammy at Battle of the Belts. If they did, it could be a transitional champion situation where Jericho and Sammy win and then quickly drop the belt to the Bucks, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe next month. I don't know exactly how they're going to get the belt onto them in this scenario, but if they can get the belt on the Bucks, that would then interest me. The idea of Sting going out there and beating the shit out of Matt and Nick Jackson and taking the belts away from them, that makes me interested in a Young Bucks match against Sting and Darby. Because otherwise, you know, to me, it just feels very self-indulgent. You know, having them be the, wow, we want to be in Sting's final match. You know, and, and they're just so cold right now. The last time we saw them, they were in the midst of a heel turn. They were throwing a fit, like a couple of children, at the end of their match at full gear. We haven't seen them since. The Young Bucks have never been colder than they are now in this company. There have been moments and, and times in this company where you know, the elite has had certain stories going or the Young Bucks had this string of great matches and they were this big attraction and they, they just feel to me right now like their stock has never been lower. And now you're going to put them in the ring with Sting and Darby at Revolution? I mean, yeah, it'll get great heel heat if the fans think that you have these close near falls where the Bucks might actually end Sting's career. I mean, I think those will get good heat. From the people in Greensboro. I think if the Bucks beat Sting in Greensboro, there might be a fucking riot in that building. But man, it would be so much better if you had those titles on the line. I just think it would add that much more heat to the match. And it would just make for a bigger moment, I think, at the uh, at the end of it. So we'll see. Uh, the one thing I have to say, though, uh, as far as Tony Khan, and you can say what you want to about his style of booking and the way he's booked certain people in this company. I've talked about it. A lot of people have talked about it. But the one thing I have always been very complimentary to him about is his treatment of Sting. Sting goes out there, he does some stupid shit. I don't think that's Tony Khan telling him to do that. Now, Tony Khan could rein him in if he wanted to. There are times where I think Tony Khan should have a chat with him and say, look, <laughs> I understand you want to go out there and you want to make a big impression on the fans. You want to do something crazy, but just dial it back here. I don't want you dying on my watch. But he has treated Sting with the reverence that you would expect someone of his caliber to be treated with. And in WWE, he never really had the chance to have that one last great run. It was cut short by injury. And it looked like his career was going to be over because he was never going to be medically cleared to come back. Five years, right? Five years, six years went by before he made his return. It was just going to be cinematic matches and we see what it turned into. Tony Khan has treated Sting with great respect since he brought him into this company. He is undefeated in every single match that he has been in. A lot of the matches that he has been in, he's gotten the winning fall. They've designed the matches in such a way to put Sting over and make Sting look like a world beater and have him out, you know, out there coming out on top and getting the hero's reaction from the crowd. They haven't buried him. They haven't made him sound and look like an old man. Right? We've seen legends treated that way in the past in wrestling. He's done the opposite with Sting. So I think that up to this point, he's treated him about as well as you could possibly expect him to be treated at his age. And I think that he will do right by Sting in whatever he does with him at Revolution because it wouldn't make sense for him to do otherwise. If Sting goes to Revolution and he loses, it's because Sting wants to lose. If he loses at that pay-per-view, I'm convinced it's because he went to Tony Khan and said, I need to lose. It's the right thing to do. This is how I was brought up in the business. I want to do business on the way out and put somebody over. Even though I think he should win. I just think in this case, it'll make for the better moment. If he goes out a winner. And I think Tony Khan wants him to retire undefeated. Why not let him retire as one half of the tag team champions and go out a champion? You know, Tony, Tony Khan... 
he he's a wrestling fan. He's a Mark, you know, call him whatever you want to, Super Mark. But the bottom line is, he's going to do right by Sting. I have faith that he will do right by Sting in the end. Whoever the opponent is, whatever the story is, whatever the situation is, because up to this point, that's what he has done with Sting. There's no reason to think that in these last two months, it's going to be done any differently. So before everybody freaks out about the Young Bucks being the opponents, let's see if they are, and let's see if they can work the tag belts into this situation. I'm hoping they do, because I think that'll be the better story. But that was your Dynamite show tonight. Not the best Dynamite. Uh, I didn't hate it. Again, I liked the Hangman match that opened the show with Claudio. Uh, Joe out there, they set up a few different things for Samoa Joe, including a title match for him next week. Uh, and the main event was, was Madness. But other than that, you know, again, the two tag matches were just thrown together for, for reasons that uh, had to do with being a tribute to Brody Lee, which I understand it was a one-week thing, so that's why they did that. Um, we had a couple of segments that were worked in there as far as the Tony Storm segment, which I got a kick out of. Uh, that moves things along with her and Deanna Perrazzo. The Adam Cole thing was just... I mean, again, it was a repeat of last week. You can just go back and rewind and watch the segment from last week. I don't know why we needed another one of those on this show. Uh, but that was Dynamite here from Daily's Place. Their big homecoming show back in Jacksonville. Here is the, uh, yes, by the way, yes. Okay, so we have some people who came in late who maybe didn't know that I acknowledged it. But I will acknowledge again Mr. Brandon Delgado. Old Recon son here from the live chat. He got some prime real estate for that Solo Monster sign on the show today. I mean, don't get no big, bigger than that. There it is right there. Brandon, thank you very much. I don't know if he's with us. He might actually be uh, watching right now. But uh, there you go. And it's funny. We were just talking about this the other night because we had the uh, Solo Monster sign at the show. We had uh, Paul Hamilton was in Portland on Monday night for Raw, and he had that Solo Monster banner, even though they were stealing people's signs away from them. He was... He was smart enough to sneak in something other than a sign, and he was in the front row representing the podcast, like I told you guys, man. You do that, you let me know. I get a picture of it, man. I'll put it up here for you. I'll let the world know. So, Brandon, thank you very much. That's going to go It's going to go into my uh, save folder right there. That's where that's going. That might, that might be one of the best ones yet. I think we might have, uh, we might have a fan or two on that AEW production team. I was only joking earlier when I made the Kevin Dunn crack. I love Mike Mansuri. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> Dynamite from Daly's Place. Here's the Twitter poll. 55% thumbs up, 45% thumbs down. Yeah, that's not great. That's not a great score. Not the best episode of Dynamite tonight. It was a little bit of a... I do like Daly's Place, though. As a venue, I do, I do like the shows from Daly's Place. Not every week, I wouldn't want to go back to that, but it is a nice location to have a wrestling show. It's an intimate venue, but it's not a tiny venue. I think it fits like 5,000 people. So it's not like a small venue. The solo army is strong. Man, we got, we got soldiers all over the country. We got soldiers all over the world. Don't forget our boy Fawaz over in Saudi Arabia, man. He's always representing the podcast. But what was the cage match rating of the show? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure Tony Khan will be on cage match later tonight to find out. I haven't checked, so I don't know. I don't know what the cage match rating is going to be for tonight's show. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that whole situation on Sunday. Uh, let's get to your super chats here. Mr. Uh, give me back shots over here. Look at this. GMB, small sample size with thoughts on Oba Femi. Uh, he's big. I could say that. I know Oba Femi, by the way, he is the new NXT North American champion. Beat uh, Dragon Lee. He cashed in his contract after Dragon Lee beat Brian Pillman Jr. on Tuesday. Oba Femi, who won the men's breakout tournament, cashed in his title opportunity on Dragon Lee, and he is the new NXT North American champion. Uh, what I've seen of him, uh, he's a big guy, which means he's going to get a lot of chances and a lot of opportunities to thrive in that company. Uh, he seems like he's on his way. 
You know, again, he's still very green. He's still very inexperienced, but I think there's a monster there waiting to break out. Uh, Dan says, gave AEW a shot tonight. I almost fell asleep. Yeah, if you were giving AEW a shot tonight, this was not the show to bank everything on. Red Emissary of Darkness, Thing's final match being the Young Bucks is embarrassing. Uh, Nick Grasso with the 999 says, Adam Cole sat in the ring and cut the same promo he cut last week. This is going to get old very fast, but that's what happens when the two most important people in the angle are out. That's the risk you run. You know, the MJF thing is something that just, look, if he's hurt, he has to get those injuries addressed. They've been doing the devil angle now for months. Adam Cole, though, they knew the severity of his injuries at the time that it happened. You know, a lot of people thought it was all just the work. Oh, he's not that hurt or he's not hurt at all. He'll be the devil. Well, he was the devil, but he's hurt. And so as severe as his injuries were, he had double ankle surgery. Said it's the worst injury of his career. I mean, for all we know, he could be out for up to a year. And that was my whole thing about Adam Cole being revealed as the devil. If that was the direction they were going to go in is that can you possibly keep this interesting for that long until he's ready to get back in the ring? And I didn't think they could. Well, they're going to have to try because he's not going to be back in the ring for a very long time. And then they lost MJF, which only makes it worse. That's the decision they made when they chose Adam Cole to be the devil in this angle. They're going to have to find other ways to make this interesting. They're going to have to use Roddy and Wardlow and... Oh, they're going to have to feud with other people, whether it be Hangman Page or Darby Allen at some point, because Darby's going to need stuff to do after... Re well, I mean, I guess after Revolution, he might be climbing a mountain, I guess, if he does Mount Everest. But that's the problem. You know, when you build an entire angle around somebody that you knew going back to September was just completely fucked. And they went forward with it anyway. They had to do the devil reveal at World's End. They dragged that out any longer. People were going to completely give up on the angle. But this guy, I mean, what's he going to do? Is he going to hobble out to the ring every week? I mean, for a month or two, that's fine. But you get to month three, month four, month five. Yeah, I would say that's going to get old pretty fast. Uh, Jimmy White says, I'm starting to think that it's more and more likely that Sasha Banks is rumble bound after tonight's episode. I've been telling you guys, I just, you know, I, I've had that feeling for a while that it's rumble season and they sprang the CM Punk surprise on us in November. And I think Sasha and the rumble, it just fits too well. I mean, there are people who swear that she's, she's as good as if she isn't already signed, she's as good as signed with AEW. But until I see it with my own eyes, I'm going to be waiting for that Royal Rumble. I, I just have a feeling she's going to pop up there. She's been doing a lot of teasing on her social media, by the way. She's always posting photos. She posted a photo earlier from an airport. Might have been the airport in Jacksonville. Who knows how old the photo is. She, she's uh, stringing people along. She's playing with people. She's toying with their emotions on social media. Lady Fire Panda with the $20 Super Chat. Fire Panda, thank you very much. Mercedes shows up at the Rumble, and then we get Mercedes against Kyrie Sane at WrestleMania. And we get Bailey against EO at Mania for the title. I also think if Charlotte did not get hurt, we would have had a four horsewomen against damage control at Elimination Chamber. Well, I guess we'll never know, will we? I guess we'll never know. Phenomenal Beard with the 999. Tomorrow is my birthday and I was in a car accident Thursday and I have been in the hospital since Sunday getting treated for ulcers stemming from gastric bypass I had eight years ago. Your content has helped me through a rough week. That's that's a pretty rough week. Uh, hopefully everything is okay as far as the car accident goes. Hopefully nothing too serious. That sucks. Phenomenal Beard. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Get well soon. Keep me posted. Keep me posted on your progress. I want to make sure that everything is going okay. That is a rough week. Chris AXC, have we gotten to the point where AEW no longer needs the Elite? 
Also, do you think Tony Khan has booked Ricky poorly because he knows he is on his way to WWE ASAP? I mean, look, Ricky Starks is one half of the tag team champions. Now, if he loses the titles on Saturday, yeah, I mean, that I could see that where maybe he, he feels that way and, you know, he gets the belts off of him and Big Bill. I, the thing is, I don't know when Ricky's contract is up. I don't know if it's, I don't even know if it's this year. Uh, I think it might be, but I, I don't know. I'm one of the people who believes that Ricky Starks is WWE bound when his contract is up. That's just what I believe. I've not been told that by anybody. I don't have any inside information on Ricky's contract. I'm just saying it feels to me, I think, he's WWE bound once he's free. Because even though he is one half of the tag champs, I, I feel like this is a guy who probably is frustrated that he's not doing more on the show. And it felt like he was going in that direction when he was working with CM Punk, and then it just didn't go that way. Yeah, you know, even before Punk had his meltdown, um, and now he's in a role that I, I don't know how happy he is in the role that he's in. As far as does AEW no longer need the Elite, AEW does not need the Elite. I think that if they would have lost the Elite, it would have been a big blow to them because you do have, I mean, now if you say Elite, if you're counting Hangman in that, you know, to lose the Bucks, Hangman, and Omega all at once, yes, that would have been a huge blow to the company. Do they need the Elite? If all the members of the Elite went away tomorrow because they were all on the injured list, and they were going to be gone for a year, they didn't have Omega, they didn't have the Bucks, they didn't have Hangman Page, would AEW wilt like a flower? No. Because they've built up that roster enough. It's like MJF. If he has to take time off, they're going to be okay without him. It's going to be a blow to the Adam Cole storyline, but they have enough talent to sustain themselves. And then it's all about Tony Khan trying to come up with compelling stories with the talent that he has. But he's got a surplus of talent. AEW does not need the elite. The elite is what helped get that company off the ground. The elite and Jericho and Moxley coming in. Collectively, they're the ones that help build AEW from the ground up. But we're five years in. The Young Bucks, like I said, have never felt colder and, le and less important than they do right now in the history of this company. If the Young Bucks did not come back tonight and they came back in six months, I'm not sure most people would have noticed. They're at a point now where they don't need the Elite. The Elite can contribute, but they are not needed to the survival of this company. Rodimus Prime, shout out to the guy with the sign on Dynamite, Solomonster Bebe. That would be Brandon, yes. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Brandon. Brandon earned himself a place in Sound of History with that sign, by the way. I mean, it was a combination of the sign and just uh, the, the production team and just getting that perfect shot. But uh, Brandon earned himself a spot in history with that sign tonight. Chris AXC, Sting and Darby against the Bucks, the send-off no one asked for. No cap. Samoa Joe dead a strong run with the strap. I give up on Ward Low Man was set to be the next Batista. He's another henchman killed his momentum. Well, before you write off Ward Low completely, let's see where this Undisputed Kingdom storyline goes. Because this storyline is designed to try to get Wardlow back to where he was. It's, it's, it's like MJF and FTR and Sean Spears and Wardlow and their faction, the pinnacle. And the whole thing with MJF and Wardlow is to eventually get him to a place where the people wanted to see him break free. And when it happened, they were fully behind him. Until Tony Khan cooled him off and he completely fucked up Wardlow. Now he's got to build him back up again. He's following the same blueprint. He's putting him in this faction, and we know where things are going. We know where it's headed. We know there's going to be trouble in paradise down the road. The hope, if you're Tony Khan, the hope is that people will react to Wardlow in the same way they did all those years ago. I don't know if they will or not. For his sake, I hope they do. Wardlow didn't do anything wrong. It's not his fault that Tony screwed the pooch with him. I don't blame Wardlow for that. But this entire angle here is designed in part 
to eventually get Wardlow back as a top baby face in this company. I believe that. So I wouldn't write him off just yet. Let, let's see how this angle goes. If this doesn't work, though, uh, I'm not really sure what else you do with him in AEW. It might be it might be time for him, frankly, to uh, to go somewhere else and uh, maybe get a second chance there. If this doesn't work. Chris Miner with the $12 Super Chat. How will your Be The Booker matches do on Cage Match? Last night's Twitter exchange between everyone was hilarious. Also, thoughts on the Oba Femi cash-in on NXT. Uh, I did see it. I have not been following NXT week to week uh, since the end of December, really. The last probably month or so. Uh, I'm behind on a lot of stuff, but I did see that. And, uh, you know, look. They had to get the belt off Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee's on the main roster. There's no reason for him to have that title. He was a stand-in for someone that... Remember, there were plans that Shawn Michaels had even in September when they fired Ali that got screwed up when they fired him. They put the belt on Trick Williams, then they put it right back on Dominic, and then Wesley was going to challenge for it at deadline, and he has a broken back, needs back surgery... Dragon Lee was not meant to be the North American champion. It was just a temporary stopgap thing until they figured out what their plan B was going to be. Their plan B turned out to be Obafemi. So they had to get the belt off Dragon Lee. They're going to try it with a young guy. I think that's great. We'll see if he takes off. He won the breakout tournament. They obviously have big plans for him. Well, here's his chance. Show the world what he can do. Dragon Lee is a main roster guy. We've had enough main roster talents holding NXT titles over the past year. I don't know how much longer that can continue for. There's no reason for Dragon Lee to run around with the North American title. Boomerang. Bigger fail for Tony Khan this week. Watching the Jaguars choke against the Titans or his Twitter meltdown? I'd say the Jaguars. Uh, there was a tweet... I saw there was a tweet going around from December from the official Jaguars Twitter account where they were advertising playoff tickets going on sale. And so as soon as they lost, everybody went back to that tweet and said all kinds of comments underneath. Welp. Oops. How do I get a refund? That's pretty embarrassing. That's pretty embarrassing. And I say that as a Mets fan, okay? So we've been through our share of that in the past where you think they're going to go to the playoffs. They're talking about selling playoff tickets. All right, playoff baseball in New York. And then the inevitable meltdown happens. Magician Sapphire. At this point, the Jericho allegations are not going away anytime soon. As a PR expert, what advice would you give Jericho and AEW to put this to bed? If he is innocent of any wrongdoing, how can he prove it? All I can say is this on, on that subject, and I said this after the scrum at World's End. There were a couple of people who asked Tony Khan about the whole situation. And there was somebody from Sports Illustrated who asked him point blank, has Chris Jericho ever been investigated while working for AEW for any kind of sexual misconduct? And instead of giving a straight answer, a definitive yes or no answer, Tony Khan danced and dodged and did not answer the question. And he simply made the comment, the now infamous comment about how AEW is the safest wrestling company in the entire world. And people, of course, mocked him for that because here's a guy who only a few months ago went on television in front of the world and claimed that he felt his life was threatened. But that wasn't an answer to the question. It turned into a whole other kind of answer. And he tap danced around it, and so the PR guy in me cringes when I see that. Uh, because there are just certain situations where, unless there is a really good legal reason not to, and maybe there's a legal reason why he just didn't want to jump into that feet first, but to me, if it's all unfounded internet rumors, which is the one comment that he did make, he said, I'm not going to indulge uh, what was the word? Unconfirmed or whatever? Internet rumors or whatever? If there's no truth to it, and it's just a bunch of BS, it was a very straightforward question, because nobody asked about Kylie Ray specifically. Nobody named names in that press scrum. They simply asked, 
has Jericho ever been investigated for misconduct? And the fact that he couldn't even give a no, all that did was make people even more suspicious about the entire situation. Now, if Jericho is innocent and didn't do anything, that's not doing a, a service to, to Jericho. It's only making him look even more guilty, like, oh, well, my God, uh, well, what, what things must they be hiding that we don't know about? It's doing a disservice to him if, in fact, nothing happened. So that answer did not help matters. And that's not the way that I would have answered or advised someone to answer a question like that, but who knows? Who knows what kind of legal issues may or may not be involved there? I don't know, but that did not do him any favors. I would have just simply said, look, I'm gonna get questions about this. There's no sense in naming names specifically. You don't have to get down in the dirt like that or, or name people, but there, there's a statement that you can make to make it very clear. That this is a company where we take things like that very seriously, right? We're not blind to what people have been saying. We've been seeing all the stuff going on online and everything, and we're not going to indulge, you know, as, as far as specific names and incidents or alleged incidents. We'll say simply say this. And then just give a very straightforward answer to the question. Sometimes all you have to do is tell the truth. And when you don't, and you avoid the question and you evade, all you do is arouse more suspicion. So it's not going to go away. The question is going to linger. There's going to be this cloud hanging over this guy. At some point, the fans may just be, you know, they, they may wash away and they may start cheering him again when the bell rings. But you're right, for a while, it's going to be a situation where they have to be worried now about what kind of reaction this guy is going to get. He's supposed to be a babyface. And now you don't know when he goes out there, is he going to get booed? Is he going to get a chance of NDA? You know, how are the fans going to react? They're not just going to forget about it overnight. It's not just going to magically go away. But he handled the situation, I thought, in a very poor way. So. Uh, we have Daniel Brink. Thank you for the $1.99. Oofman Entertainment. Anna Jay is getting a TBS title show. Title shot. I think he means on Battle of the Bell. Okay, so there you go. Battle of the Bells. It's official. Anna Jay is getting a title shot against Julia Hart. So at least something came out of that eight woman tag. At least something came out of that match. Bender McSimpson solo. I respectfully disagree. I think Sting and Darby against the Bucks would be a great send off for Sting. Well, you're certainly entitled to have that opinion. I mean, look, I, I don't hate it the way that some people are going to just hate it with every fiber of their being. It just doesn't do anything for me unless you put some kind of stakes on that match. Some kind of stipulation, the titles, there has to be something involved. If you just do the, the Bucks against Thing and Darby, I mean, look, they got seven, was it seven weeks? Seven or eight weeks? Seven weeks. They have seven weeks to, to convince me that I'm wrong and that I should be interested in this match. We'll see if Tony Khan can do it. Jose Hitch. Just now leaving Daily's greatest show and good crowd. Props to those men and women's wrestling in below 50 degree weather. Yeah, again, it was colder than you would expect in Florida tonight. I didn't uh, know exactly what the temperature was, but unless they had uh, like, like heaters around ringside, which I think they do for some of the WrestleManias, especially when they're in the Northeast out outdoors. Unless they had something like that, it probably wasn't too fun to be wrestling out there. Justin G, if I just got 1% of what Danielson's going to take in from fines this week, I could retire to Europe. Thank you, Solomon. I, he's like a meter maid, man. Those meter maids, I don't know how it is in other places, but here in New York, they are vicious. They don't, they don't give a shit. They don't care. They will ticket you. They don't care who you are. They will ticket the cops. There are cops that have come outside to find their car with a ticket on the windshield. These meter maids, they have to hit their quota, and they don't care. Brian Danielson's like a meter maid, man. He's like, he's writing those, he's writing those fines. He's sticking them in their bags. He's sticking them in their mailboxes. He's gonna, he's gonna make bank for that company and those fines. Uh, DEH says Malachi Wardlow Ricky counting down their days. 
What was it? The uh, the statistic in 2023, not one singles match for Malachi Black? I, I believe not one. Unbelievable. Uh, he also says, I know he's getting a huge push right now, but do you see Adam Cole wanting to work under Triple H or do you see him stay? NXT Adam Cole was one of a kind. I don't think that Adam Cole is one of those people who's in a rush to leave, especially because he gets to work with Britt. You know, Britt works for the same company. They get to travel together. I don't think you can minimize that. I think that's something that's probably very important to him. And they've treated him very well. Why would he want to leave? He's in a great position right now. He's, he's positioned as one of the top heels. He's got his own faction. I'm sure the company is taking good care of him as he convalesces from his injury. He got to be in the main event at Wembley Stadium in front of 75,000 people against MJF. I mean... There are people in that company who I could see having a reason to want to leave. I don't think Adam Cole is one of those people. Rizzo. The funniest comment I saw about the Jags tweet was someone saying, I bought 10 tickets. When is the playoff schedule getting released? Yeah, and then I saw the comments. Who wants to be the one to tell that guy? Who wants to tell him? Uh, Barry MK. What's a theme song that sounds good but has some really odd lyrics? Billy Kidman's song. Billy Kidman's WWE theme song is a banging theme. And then you listen to the lyrics and yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But it's a great song. If you just listen to it, the beat, I love it. I think it's great. Never paid too much attention to the lyrics though. When I did, I said, huh. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the goal for Be The Booker tonight was 400 likes. We are at 428. So uh, we have officially surpassed our goal for the night. I thank you for that. So let's get to it. Let's go ahead and be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. Hey, look at that. And you all thought Mercedes wasn't going to show up on Dynamite tonight. There she is. Mercedes Monet. Might not have been on TBS, but she's on this stream here tonight. Maybe we'll pick her tonight and be the book. You know, AEW is doing their own Battle of the Belts special on Saturday. How about we do our own? We're going to do it. We're going to book our own Battle of the Belts right now here and be the booker. All title matches. All title matches. And we're going to start things out here. Wow, what a team this is. You know, I have no memory of this even being a thing in the latter years of WCW. But apparently, the great Muda and Vampiro were the WCW Tag Team Champions. No memory of this, but the photo doesn't lie. Apparently it happened. Vampiro and the great Muta are going to be defending those titles. <laughs> against another pair of former WCW Tag Team Champions, Bret Hart and Bill Goldberg. I'm going to give that the bell because we get Muda and Bret Hart in the ring together, and I can't give that the buzzer. I think Muda and Bret Hart in the ring, that alone is worth the bell. Plus, if Bret is teaming with Goldberg and he's not wrestling Goldberg, then he's safe. He's safer than he would be if they were on opposite sides of the ring. See, it's smart for Brett to have Goldberg on his side. So that gets the bell. And again, I have no memory of this. I have no memory of them being the tag team. I know they were, but I couldn't tell you how they won the belts, who they lost them to, who they beat for them. I haven't got the faintest idea. Can they coexist? Maybe not for too long. All right, so that's one title match down. I'll let you, I'll let you guys decide who wins that one. Yeah, see, that's a match. See, Roderick says that's a match I never knew I wanted. Brett against Muda. Although Brett and Tiger Mask didn't really have a great match. You would think that would be like an all-timer. They wrestled in 1990. It wasn't that good. All right, here we go. Women's Be The Booker. Let's book ourselves a title match, and we're going to begin with... Okay. 
All right. Marina Shafir. Marina Shafir. Well. Huh. Marina Shafir one on one with Tessa Blanche. <laughs> You know, I was talking about Teddy Hart on the podcast a few weeks ago. We were talking about careers and people that have crashed and burned. And uh, I don't know that there's been a bigger crash and burn than Tessa Blanchard. Men's be the booker. We're going to book ourselves a world heavyweight championship match. Save us. We need to be saved. And we begin... This is not how I wanted to be saved. The Miz. The Miz. Uh, the Miz is going to defend the WWE Championship. I don't even know that it matters. But The Miz will defend against Nick. Jackson. And I just got done talking about how the Young Bucks have never been colder in their career. And we end up with Nick Jackson wrestling The Miz for the WWE Championship. <laughs> well... That right there is what you call a fail. That's what that is. We tried. We failed. We went one for three. Take your Brett and Muda and enjoy it. Because that's about as good as it gets. Standard TV match. Says electrical flare. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much uh, what you would get from it. Pretty much a standard television match. <laughs> One of the worst Be the Booker main events of all time. Well, they can't all be winners. A catastrophic night. Well, we could always try again on Friday, because that's the next time I will be live with you. It will be Friday night. We're going to talk about SmackDown. And if you missed episode 842 of the podcast, it is up for your listening pleasure on all your usual audio platforms. I hope you'll check that out. And I hope that you will give this video a like on your way out if you have not already done so. I want to give one last shout out to this man right here, Mr. Brandon Delgado. Showing some love to the sound off tonight on TBS. I thank you, sir. Brandon, you are the man representing the podcast, brother. And uh, I will see you and everybody else back here on Friday night for the SmackDown stream. Until then, be well, stay safe. And always remember, Solomonster Bebe. That's how it is. Hey, Chris Miner says, how did Be the Booker do on Cage Match? I'll ask Tony Khan and I'll find out. When, I, when he tells me the answer, I'll let you guys know. I'm off to cage match right now to find out. I'll see you guys on Friday night.